Thank you, that was truly beautiful. Just as Melissa would have wanted it to be. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for this program that is a testimony to Melissa's life and love. On behalf of Larry and Scotty and Katie, we want to say a very special thank you to the family, to the church family, to the Loma Linda Health family, to all those who have come here this afternoon to be a part of this. The purpose of this afternoon is it's simple and it's clear. We will come together, we will read passages of scripture, we will listen to beautiful music, but mostly we will tell stories of Melissa. We will sit here in a space that is sacred. We will laugh, we will remember, we will cry. And for the purposes of keeping her alive in our hearts and our souls as we go forward. We will commit her to our memories, and that will be sacred. The Christ said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And so this afternoon we will mourn, but we will also be comforted. Let us pray as we begin this service. To the God who is above and beyond all things, to the one in whom we move and live and have our being, we come to you this afternoon morning because you have promised that we will be comforted. In these moments, Lord, we pray for a special awareness of your presence. We pray for memories that are clear and sharp as we keep in our hearts and our souls the joy that Melissa is and will continue to be. Bless us now in these things. Amen. Good afternoon. I'm Roger Hadley, I'm Dean Emeritus of the School of Medicine. For a short period of time, I was a mentor of Melissa's. For the last several years, however, she has been my mentor. Early on, I would mistakenly call her Melissa. With the politeness of your favorite grade school teacher, Melissa conveyed to me that her name is Melissa. Without, sar without sarcasm in her voice, she kindly said, Dr. Hadley, if you think of my South American roots, you'll remember that in Spanish, all I's are pronounced E's. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> Melissa was not only a crucial member of the medical school's leadership team, she is also my wife's physician. Her flair and leadership may have been first recognized in 2004. In April of that year, the young Melissa Kidder had already demonstrated level-headed and mission-minded thinking, which prompted her OBGYN colleagues to select her to be the department representative on the Dean's Search Committee to replace Dr. Alan King, who is stepping down as chairman of the department. One colleague pointed out she was a trusted team player. Ten years later, in 2014, Dr. Patton stepped down and I asked Melissa to serve as interim chair because of her logical, selfless, and mission-oriented approach to problem solving. Ten days later, the Dean's search committee, made up of chairs of other departments, quickly named Melissa as the preferred candidate. The chair of the committee reported that she said she enjoyed the role of leadership. The cynical members of the committees, many of whom were department chairs, snickered because no one enjoys the job of being a chair. So it was suggested that the minutes would not use the word enjoy. Instead, the word in the minutes were, she was intrigued by the challenge. <laughs> Subsequently, I met with vice deans, Dr. Tammy Thomas and Richard Peverini, both who enthusiastically endorsed her as chair of OB. 
The following day, I met with Lisa, and she and I mapped out a plan to announce her new role as chair. I was to talk to the OB GYN Grand Rounds where the faculty and the residents attended. However, when we got there at 8 o'clock the next morning, Melissa forgot that this was a residents-only meeting, and it seemed awkward to tell who, the, who their new chair was without the faculty there. So we decided to do what we do in modern times and sent out the note by email. Everybody received this with enthusiasm. It's important to note right here that her pioneering spirit and proven competence, Melissa would become only the second woman to be a chair of a clinical department in the 105-year history of the School of Medicine. Congratulations, Melissa. Later that year, in December 2014, the Faculty Practice Corporation, known as Faculty Medic Group, was given the opportunity to put five of its members on the overarching board of directors of our campus, known as Loma University Health. Secret ballots among the directors of the Faculty Practice Plan were taken, and Melissa, along with four others, were selected by her peers to be the, beyond the directors of the Loma University Health, representing the 500 plus physicians practice group at Loma Linda's highest board. The practice has since doubled during that, since that time. Two years later in 2016, Melissa came by my office. She appeared distressed and wanted to talk to me for a few minutes. She started the conversation with, I have horrible news. A few days before, she noticed her makeup did not match her skin. Her staff and colleagues, they noted just a hint of jaundice. Subsequent liver function testing occurred. The enzymes were abnormal, and the bilirubin slightly elevated. She then told me bluntly, I have pancreatic cancer. I was stunned. Every physician knows the implication of pancreatic cancer. Melissa then talked about her family. She wept a bit about Larry, about their son, Scott. She said that she wanted to see her 11-year-old daughter grow up. After all, these are the years when a daughter needs their mom most. In April 2017, she had teach me a lesson that has proven invaluable over ensuing years. She said that the chemotherapy is her friend and ally. Indeed, she was scared to stop the cancer-curing medication. In addition, she embraced the often dreaded side effects of chemotherapy with a positive attitude. She said these side effects were the signs that the cancer was being beaten down. It was her army, find, her army fighting the enemy. It is this attitude that I learned to admire in Melissa. 2017, the Dean's Committee and the University approved recommendation that Dr. Melissa Kidder receive the Distinguished Service Award for the School of Medicine for her commitment and success in fulfilling the mission of the medical school. One month later, it was physically awarded to her at the School of Medicine commencement ceremony. In August of the same year, 2017, Melissa wrote the following email to her colleagues. With an abundance of love, this is this is the um, email that Lisa wrote. With an abundance of love for each of you in our department, the time has come for me to step aside as your chair and allow the School of Medicine to embark on a search for a new leader. This is in no way means that my health status is declined. It is stable, and at this time I continue with chemo cycles. Further, she said, I am forever grateful to Dr. Wagner for immediately stepping in as acting chair at the beginning of January. I'm also thankful for Dr. Chung taking up all the responsibilities required for the residency program director and seeing the program through the changes. You have each done more than your share in getting the department through new adventures these past several months. I couldn't be more proud. She continued, I have no doubt that God will lead the search committee I have no doubt that God will lead the search committee in identifying the best person to lead our department forward in the years to come. The women of the Inland Empire, our residents and the medical students, need your continued special care, skills, quality, and love. And you desire a leader to support all of this. And you deserve a leader to support all this over the long term. 
Thank you for all your personal notes, meals, visits, and especially every single prayer. I am so blessed to have a support team. With much love and respect, Melissa. On June 6, 2018, I text Melissa and ask her to give a prayer of dedication at the freshman medical student's white coat ceremony. Her response was, I'm getting a CT scan, and if negative, I'm going to drive across the country with the kids in a rented RV and go to Toronto for a family reunion. If positive, she'll be in town and will give the prayer. I text back the following words. I am counting 100% on a negative CT scan, and I will not plan to have you here for the white coat ceremony. May of 2018, Lisa Kidder gave the devotional to her fellow directors on the university's board of trustees and told her story. She ended with two texts. I want to end my presentation with the same two texts. First text, Psalms 31, 7. David says, I will be glad and rejoice in your unfailing love, for you have seen my troubles and you care about the anguish of my soul. The second text, Isaiah 54, 10. Even if the mountains prove fickle and temporary, even if the hills fall to pieces under stress and leave you unprotected, my love won't walk away from you. My covenant commitment of peace won't break down and fall apart. I, the God whose gut wrenches with compassion for you, tell you so. He has brought stillness.
I'm Lanu. I first met Melissa in 1976, seventh grade, Ms. Brightup's classroom, homeroom at Browning Elementary in South Lancaster, Massachusetts. Her family had relocated there from the mission field, and her father had been called to serve in the Atlantic Union Conference. And we seemed to have an instant connection. We had so many things in common, and those of you who have girls who have gone through junior high know that it can be a sensitive, odd time as we deal with our hormones and changing friend groups and all sorts of things. But I was kind of a nerd, and Melissa was a nerd. We were both STEM nerds together, and we loved music, and she was a fantastic pianist. And she became my rock steady friend. So fast forward a few months, I convinced her to learn the viola. She started taking piano lessons with Virginia Jean Rittenhouse, and I'd known Virginia Jean for years as well, and I took piano lessons with Mrs. Schenkel. And I said, you gotta learn the viola so we can play an orchestra together. And she did. And we played and served as standmates for a long time in the New England Youth Ensemble. And we remained close. We nurtured our spiritual lives. We engaged um, in friendly academic competition against one another. We sang in choir through high school. We even played in band. She played the flute. I played percussion. We played viola, of course, together and toured together. And Larry, despite your story of our shenanigans, we were perfect angels. We did no trouble on those tours, Larry. From junior high through college, we were together. We both studied at Atlantic Union College, and we had overlapping majors. I studied biology, she was studying medical technology. And at that time, you did two years at Atlantic Union College, and you went on for the final two years at Hinsdale. And so, I had to give up my friend to Hinsdale in 1984. And she came back, we'd meet when we were on tour, and we would reunite for, on those occasions. And in 1985, we reunited in New Orleans at the general conference session. And by then, she was sharing stand with Larry Kidder. And um, both of them, looked at me in the first rehearsal that day. I was sitting third in the circle, and uh, they looked at me. They had this amused look on their face, and smiley, kind of giddy, and they held up their right wrists. And I don't know how many of you know what that means, and they had matching watches. <laughs> and back in the day, those of you who aren't familiar with traditional North American Adventist culture, when you got a watch on your right wrist from your beloved, you were engaged. And so she was engaged. And a few months later, after graduation in 1986, Larry and Melissa were married. And our life's journeys began as adults. You know, my son calls it adulting. He says it's tough. And I said, I know but it's worthwhile. And uh, she and Larry moved on to Florida. I stayed in the area, went to UMass Medical School after taking a year off. And uh, she worked as a medical technologist for years across the country, as you know, and Larry's written that so beautifully in the obituary. And despite us ending up on opposite sides of the country, our friendship continued. And when I look back on it, it's really remarkable. We really only spent eight years in the same physical vicinity. And I don't want to tell you how old I am now, but you can put it together. And our friendship endured all of that. And eventually, our career paths, as you know, led us both into medicine, where she belonged all along. And through the many years, through our pregnancies, because both of us were older when we had our children, through our pregnancies, through our residencies, through our crazy careers, we managed to keep in touch. And ironically enough, my first official professional job in medicine was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, 
home of her dad's family. And it was so nice to see that full circle coming back together again, that I could be in the place where my best friend's family was. And I met Uncle Dan at church and uh, learned to love Hatch Green Chili. Both Melissa and I had a son and a daughter in that order, not very many years apart from each other. Our sons, I think, are three or three years apart, and our daughters are one year apart. And whenever we were in striking distance of one another, we made a point of trying to see each other, whether it was in New Mexico uh, for brunch or a few minutes or a few hours such as supper during a business trip to California for me, or grinders at John's Pizza in Clinton after a Vermont uh, board trip for Melissa. What person thinks of others and doing things for others while sitting in a chemo infusion chair? Well, Melissa did. So in cahoots with Karen, she surprised my family by showing up at my daughter Maya's high school graduation last June, a week following chemotherapy. She said, Lenu, I was feeling really good. She said, I got on my phone and I made the reservations. So she came out. <coughs> she was a gem, a one of a kind. So to all of you, cherish and cultivate your friendships. May you be as fortunate to experience a friendship as ours. So to you, Melissa, my meticulous, eloquent, loyal, inquisitive, selfless, strong, advocative friend, I can't wait to see you. I can't wait to see you smile again and hear your laughter and play viola together as we play the Bach Alleluia to our heavenly king. Good, ap <clears throat> Good afternoon, I'm Karen. I am Melissa's partner in crime on the West Coast, according to Lanou. <laughs> and part of me thinks that had I been back in, the, in New England with them, we would have gotten in a lot of trouble together. But always good, clean fun, of course. So Melissa and I have been friends about 25 years. But of those 25 years, I mean, she was a good friend all along, but of those 25 years, the last seven were the most precious. Kind of shaky beginning of our friendship. We started attending two-year-old Sabbath school. My husband, Art, and I were a little bit late in the game getting into Sabbath school, but we showed up to two-year-old Sabbath school when um, my older son, Daniel, would no longer stay asleep in his little bucket over here in the transept. So we started going, and that's kind of, we were introduced by a mutual friend, and that's when I first uh, remembered her. And one Sabbath that I recall, we were sitting next to each other, and Daniel was sitting on my lap. Of course, Scott was sitting on hers. And out of the blue, Daniel looked at Scott, and he just let loose this huge sneeze, kind of showery, and I'm sure, I'm sure it got Melissa too, but I was horrified. Uh, we were a little bit, uh, still not so certain about, you know, getting into the whole Sabbath school social scene, but um, I knew she was, I knew she was a physician, I just cringed, and I looked for a hole in the floor, but there, there was no hole that I could just slip into. And when I looked up, Melissa shot back this look that honestly, it frightened me. <laughs> um, I'm sure some of you seen that look. I bet some of you have at some point in time. But um, 
that was it. That, that was kind of us starting to get to know each other, and thankfully she cut me a little slack along the way. So seven years ago, after her diagnosis, um, I stopped by one day, and as I tried to do that pretty regularly, and uh, I just had to tell her. I said, you know, I've been meaning to tell you all these years that when I first met you, and I told her about what happened in Sabbath school, and she, she didn't, fortunately, she didn't remember it, you know, but um, she said, wow. She goes, well, I'm so glad we became friends in spite of it because God knew I needed you in my life. And she would say that every now and then. She'd make that statement to me, and, and I appreciated it. But I wouldn't really fully come to understand that until a little more recent. So our Sabbath school friends became our small church within this huge church. And of course, we would see each other as the years went on, school, events, uh, so many of our kids were in the same class together. Scott and Daniel ended up in the same grade starting in kindergarten, and I think they made it all the way through fifth grade. Uh, without any help from me, I know, I'm not sure about it, Melissa, but they just ended up in the same class. And along the way, soon thereafter, I think it was about maybe first grade, I could be wrong, but Melissa found out that we loved to camp. And she said, oh, we do too. So would you like to, to join us and go camping? And she invited my family and a couple of other dear friends and their family and that little group. We continued that all the way up to last October. And um, in that group, each one, uh, each person in that group became aunties and uncles to each other's kids. So when you're talking about a village helping you, absolutely, lifelong aunties and uncles. She invited us, and of course, Melissa, as you know, and you've already heard, is the great organizer. Um, she organized us. And to this day, she's the one that I think really brought us all together out of that Sabbath school class. And uh, it was the funniest thing because she was always organizing. She was like the most wonderful host. And all this time, uh, until I figured out where we all kind of fell within ages, I always thought she was the oldest one amongst all of us. However, she ended up being the youngest one amongst all of us, but she just had this knack for taking charge, and the rest of us were like, yeah, whatever, sure, let's do it, you know? Um, so we started uh, camping in the local mountains, and um, eventually, since we were coming back for more each year, she said, well, why don't we try Mammoth? And that was a favorite of hers, had been a favorite of my husband and mine's as well. And we would go up there, to view the most beautiful fall colors. We'd go up there to gaze at the stars. We had many wonderful devotionals around the campfire, wonderful stories, great conversations. We ate way too much food every time we went, and that food would always seem to multiply. We'd bring back about just as much as we, we took. It was a great way for her to and all of us really to decompress. But I remember her saying, I love coming up here because I can leave all of my responsibilities behind and I can just be me up here. And I can say anything to all, any of you because you don't have the same ties as I do. And so the mantra became, well, what happens in Mammoth stays in Mammoth. And, um, and we honored that, we honored that to this day. I've heard stories, I, I don't get into it, but your secrets are safe with us. In all those years that I recall, Melissa never missed a year after her diagnosis of going up to Mammoth and ensuring, doing whatever she could to make sure she got there. Sometimes it would be uh, 
we'd arrange a date, pick a date that was the furthest from her chemo so that she had a little chance to recover. Uh, there was one time, um, maybe more than once, uh, she had just had some pretty big procedure, surgery even, and uh, she would say, hey, you want to go to Mammoth? I said, sure, let's do it. Uh, but are you feeling okay? Oh, yeah, I'm good. So sure enough, she would make it there. And um, whether it was hooked up to oxygen, needing a little extra oxygen to take with her, battery run, it was a great gizmo. Or uh, looking back, COVID didn't stop her. Wildfires didn't stop her or us. And we continued. And it was just, it became to me Christmas in October. And I would always thank her. I'd say, man, that was a great trip. You know, that's like, it's always like Christmas in October because it was a gift. It was a gift to have her present another year to enjoy Mammoth with us. So yes, I remember that year, that day, I received the text from Elisa saying that she had been diagnosed with pancreatic and um, felt like a punch to the stomach. I wasn't quite sure what to do with that. I've never had a friend who had been diagnosed with a terminal illness. So usually I would text before I'd stop by, but this time I thought, um, I better get over there. So I just showed up and Scott was home. I think they're out buying glasses for Katie. You know, when you get a diagnosis, you go glass, glasses shopping. Um, but we prayed together. I thought it was a little uncharacteristic of me. I said, can, can we pray before we all leave? And she said, sure. And so I did. And um, as we were saying goodbye to everyone, another friend had, had arrived there too, another dear friend, Deanne. Um, saying goodbye and hugging each other, she whispered to me and said, thank you, you're, you're one of my dearest friends. And you know, I try to be aware of, of what is going on around me and I thought, wow, I had no clue. I had no clue. So I thought though, wow, if that's what she thinks, I guess I better step up and be, and be that kind of friend. And so I did, and I told her over the course, uh, you know, as she started doing her chemo, I said, you know what, you should never feel alone. I knew her sleep and she'd be up crazy hours, and I would be cra up crazy hours too, but that was by choice. I um, could easily be up at one or two in the morning. I said, so if you ever need someone to talk to or you're, whatever it is, just text me, and she would. And I received a few of those two or three o'clock in the morning texts. And if I was up, I would respond back to them. And I would say, not every time, but I was up much of the time. And I would try to be very intentional about stopping by and visiting. Uh, you know, I've read and, and heard so much about tough, so much tougher making friendships when you're a little older. And it is, and you have to be so much more intentional about it. So I tried to do that. and. Uh, And our friendship developed into one of the most precious friendships I've ever had. Now, it, Melissa wasn't always having a tough time. There would be times things would smooth out. I'd hear that the markers, oh, they're really great right now, and, and she was feeling good. So I got a text. I never really understood texting. I'm old school enough that I thought, why don't people just call each other? But I see where texting comes in so handily. So I received this text. Hey, Karen, you want to go walking with me? And I knew she had been walking pretty regularly. Early mornings, it would be cold, whatever. Uh, and she'd go by herself a lot. Sometimes she'd go with others. But I said, sure, let's do it. And she would do anything to promote longevity and staying fit and active was definitely one whenever she was feeling up to it and well. And that became part of a regimen. I want to say, I think that was about in 2021. So we'd walk at least one day a week, 
I was working still at the time. And then I received another text. Okay, I'm going to invite others, Deanne, Pam, Minnie. She goes, but I'm, I want you to plan the route. And I said, okay, I can do that. How far do you want to go? Well, let's go about three, three or four miles. And um, sometimes we occasionally make it upwards five mile mark around there. And the one time I remember, and Minnie was with us, <laughs> I still feel bad, Minnie, but um, you know, along the way we were aiming for about four and Alicia's saying, how you doing? Everybody okay here? Oh yeah, so, sounds good. So I said, okay, we'll go a little further. And, and then I kind of took this wrong turn and um, instead of like five-ish miles, when we got back, it was like a little over six. And um, I don't know, many never joined us again after that. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure what happened, so I do apologize, Minnie. But, um, but I heard you got out of the car okay, and you know you weren't stuck in the car with your bad knee. So, uh, one thing um, that Melissa and I would do is we would we would share, uh, as many of you do, like, hey, I saw this great movie or I read this great book, and uh, why don't you check it out? And before we actually started walking, um, I had told her about a movie called The Way. And if you've ever heard of that, it has Martin Sheen, and he's walking the Camino de Santiago in memory of his son. And I told her about that. She went back and, and watched it again. And so, guess what? I get a text one day. Hey, Karen, what do you think about walking the Camino de Santiago? I said, yeah, okay, sure, let's do it. And uh, a little bit after that, and I think it should just be the girls. Well, the guys could probably just stay at home. I said, okay, let me run that by my husband. I think he's fine with it. She was walking and um, a period of months, and she was doing really well. And then, of course, something else, some other issue came up. But she was researching. I'm going to tell you. I know you know that. She's already researching the routes. She was saying that, well, I don't know if I want to stay in the public hostels, but let's see if I can find some private lodging along the way. And, and maybe we should stick to the Camino Frances because uh, there's more that we can eat there and the Portugal coastline. There's too much shellfish there. She was planning already, and I really do believe had she held on a little longer and was able to walk. I, I think we might have been on a plane headed to, uh, headed to France. I love those walks. We talked about everything, whether whoever was with us or not. Uh, Scott and Katie, if, if your ears were ever burning, um, and my voice too, it's because obviously we're talking about you as any self-respecting moms would do. We talked about challenges for our kids. We talked about hopes and dreams for our children. And she was your number one ally, you know that, absolutely. So last year, my family, we suffered a huge loss lost my husband, and Melissa came through for me, and I was so appreciative. I know any friend would do that, and so many of you here have done that for us as well. I think what sets Melissa apart is because early on, our friendship, not only did we have fun and do fun things together, send each other silly, stupid memes and such, but we also shared with each other, God in his comfort and his faithfulness, and his faithfulness to his promises. After our huge loss, I'd get texts, hey, remember to breathe, are you breathing? She would say, what's on the schedule for this week? And I'd tell her, I have this appointment. Um, and if my sons were able to accompany me, then they did, and if they didn't, She's saying, well, can I do that for you? And she'd drive me there. She would also share a devotional from her dear friend Kent. 
Kent would send her some kind of devotional text, promise of hope every night so that she would have it to read in the morning. And she would pass on and send on those pertinent ones for me, and I so appreciated that. Checked in with me on various holidays. Hey, what are you doing? Are you going down to San Diego? If not, come and have Thanksgiving with us. What are you doing the Sabbath? Come over and have dinner with us. Always inviting us, always the hostess, definitely. And then one of her last statements, and she goes, well, you know, one of these days I might, upon occasion, I might just have to invite you to join me on some of my adventures, my travel adventures. I said, okay, sure. <laughs> and I began to understand her statement, God knew I needed you in my life. So I get a text one day, this is last June, actually May. Hey, what are you doing? What are you doing this weekend? If I can get tickets to New England, to Boston, would you care to join me? I'd like to have you accompany me so I can go hand out, present my Melissa Martinez scholarship at South Lancaster Academy. It was very dear to her. I probably should plug that in. It is on the back of your program, by the way, so take a good look at that. But she made those, yes, reservations, as Lenny said, from her chemo chair. She did it before one of the drugs, which would send her kind of loopy, uh, kicked in. She goes, send me your information. I'm going to do that. And she made the reservations. She made the rental car reservations and the hotel reservations. And so nice of her to give me about 18 hours to realize I was going uh, so I had time to pack. <laughs> and uh, I've heard later on that, like, Jeannie, you didn't know she was going. Minnie didn't know she was going until she was at the gate. We were at the gate ready to get on the plane. So I was, I was really glad then Scott was home because he at least knew we were going. And I don't know, <laughs> I don't know about you, Larry, if you know or not. But uh, yes, so the following day, we got on the plane and um, headed back there. And for those of you who are coming from the East Coast, it was such a treat to tour around that campus and to see um, many of those important places that were so important to Melissa. And we're driving down the road and see that house over there? That's where the Kidders live. And this is my house over here and that tree. And I thought she was going to say, well, that's where Larry gave me my first kiss. But it wasn't, that wasn't the tree, Larry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, um, and it was no one else's tree either. She, okay, just to make sure. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, and the big one, oh, her favorite ice cream place. I forget the name of the little store out there by the um, belted Galloway cows that are so cute. And um, took me to, I heard, was the second best grinder place in all of New England because uh, the, the original first one burned down, which I was so sad because that second one was really pretty good. I can only imagine what the top, the top grinder place would have been like. She uh, had such a passion for Adventist Christian education, and uh, she presented four, four scholarships that day, and it was such a delight to meet so many friends and some relatives whose names some of you I've heard about over the years. And it was all good, so I'm just letting you know. But it was so nice to finally meet you and see some of those places. One of my last texts to Melissa As she was declining, I said to her, I don't perceive you to be done just yet because you're way too ornery. And only God knows the plans he has for you. But what I have observed throughout your journey and know is this, you've brought glory and honor to God every step of the way. Your sphere of influence is huge and your faith in him and his faithfulness to you, his power and his grace have been observed by many. 
I know I've seen miracles and a few mountains moved along the way. I've never seen anything like it. Such a privilege. I miss her so much. I'm very grateful for the hope we have in a risen Savior. And that he's promised to return one day. And when he does, what a great day that's going to be to see Melissa restored. And I'm just going to warn you now, I think she's going to be raring to go. And even though we're going to be restored as well, I think we might have trouble keeping up. I really do. But as I have discovered, and I knew you guys have discovered already, the tough part is between now and then. That's the hard part, in spite of the promise and the hope that we have. So Larry and Scott and Katie, and Jeannie and Loy, Minnie and Rob, Nicole, Karina and Allie, may God bless you and keep you, comfort you, and give you his perfect peace. It's my prayer. Amen. And thank you so much.
Thank you, that was truly beautiful. It is an important thing to sit here in this sacred space and savor this moment, to not rush it. Thank you. Have you ever had a moment where you have found particular resonance in the work of an author? You have found yourself comforted by a song. You have found your experience articulated in a poem. Melissa found this in the book of Job, and she has chosen this text for us today. Uh, there is no greater work in all of literary history to deal with the topics of loss and hope, pain, justice, and she has chosen these texts for us. And so today, this homily is for her and her family and all of us who deal with hope and loss, pain and injustice. The story of Job begins with a man who is incredibly competent, a man who knows what he is doing, but then he encounters loss. He loses the things that he had loved and held dearly. And the language that we find in the scriptures is, is so well put together. From Job 16, the statement is this, everything was going well, but now my face is red with tears. It's relatable, isn't it? Everything was going well. We had these plans for the future. We knew what we were hoping for. We had a vision of joy ahead of us. It was going well. But now there is loss. And my face is red with tears. Melissa, she felt loss. And we feel loss as we sit here. And I want to take a moment to recognize that and just sit in that. It's terrible. And I am so, so sorry for it. I remember as I was speaking with Melissa, listening to her story, she was recounting the moment when she had to step back from medicine. And you know those moments as you're talking to someone, how you feel in those moments, them telling something particularly true about themselves. She slowed down and she said, listen, I had to step away because I could no longer be confident in my work with the scalpel. And as she was telling me this story, she was enacting it again with her hands. She slowed down and she said, listen, I could no longer feel the difference between the tendon and the nerve. I knew I wasn't safe to heal. And in that moment, she paused and I could see in her face just the immense loss that she felt. Years of training, the ability to heal, now lost. Or has already been said so well, again, in another moment where just the truth of her soul was shared as she was so open and generous, I just want to see my kids grow up. Just loss. We just need to recognize that and speak to it. But in that loss, we must also speak to her courage and her strength. I got to know Melissa and Larry as we traveled around the Middle East. There is a certain disposition of a person that sits at the back of a bus in high school and primary school and continues to do so on a Holy Lands tour. And Melissa and Larry were those people and so was my wife and I, okay? <laughs> Sat up the back and made trouble, basically. It was just a joy to get to know them and to discover in Melissa such a sharp and witty person. We pulled up to the pyramids, and as we arrived there, 
Melissa realised that she might not be able to get onto the camel. She wanted to go for a camel ride, but in that moment she felt the sadness and the loss. It was my wife who first made the joke. She said, hey honey, perhaps you could finally use your muscles for something useful. <laughs> And Melissa caught the joke immediately, and it was very funny. She had already summed me up in a moment. See, I am a youth minister, and I, I like to work out, and it's not because I believe in the health message or I'm planning a long and productive life. It's because I'm vain, okay? It's just simple vanity, and Melissa saw that as well, and she chimed in and started teasing me. Do you want to finally list something useful? <sighs> there was a courage in her. And so Larry and myself picked her up and put her on a camel. She enjoyed the ride, as you saw in those pictures just a few moments ago. When we came back, she had taken a picture of my wife and I from her vantage point and printed it out and sent it to us, along with a beautiful message, continuing to tease me as well as she rightly should. In the loss, there was a courage to still savour every moment that she could. She fought, and it was brave. Job, everything was going well, but now my face is red with tears. As Job sits in that loss, in the rest of the scriptures from the book there, there is more going on. There is a complex theodicy that is occurring. There is a very, very good God who is encountering the free actions of an agent that is acting against his purposes. There is this, this, this court seated in heaven. But, but Job knows none of this. And in Job's loss, he begins this process where he, he tries to tackle his suffering from the perspective of an intellectual puzzle. He is trying to work out why he is suffering. He looks at these themes of justice and loss. He, he, he dives into it. But he comes to this point where he realizes that he doesn't need an intellectual puzzle to be solved, he cries out in Job 13, 20, just summons me to your presence, O God, and I will answer. See, Job has this beautiful realization, I don't need a solution, I just need the strength of somebody who is there with me. He comes to God's presence and say, listen, I can get through this suffering as long as I know that you are for me and not against me. I can do this if I know that you love me. My fear is that I am suffering because you don't love me. But if I just know that you are with me in this, I can gain strength from that to get through this. And that was the beauty of Melissa's heart. She drew such great strength from God in her suffering. There aren't many people who with late stage pancreatic cancer decide to travel through the Middle East and take her parents and her husband and care for them on the way. Or I saw her at church and I came up to her and I said, how are you doing? It's so good to see you. And her simple reply was this, I am good because I am here. She just wanted to be in the presence of God, just summons me and I will answer. I will gain strength for this if I know you are with me. It is a very uh, simple metaphor. My wife and I, we used to have a dog, a particularly robust dog, a strong dog, who was known for her courage, except for in all things when it came to the vet. I would take her to the vet and I would place her on the table. And there was no way that I could explain to my dog that right now she needs to have an injection. She needs a vaccine. Listen, we've taken the active components of this disease. It will go into your immune system. Your immune system will cause a response. This is, there was no way I could explain that to my dog. But as I put it there on the table, she would bury her head into me and take her strength from my presence while she waited for her shots. The scriptures and the... The cry of Job is simple. Because Job doesn't have access to this theodicy that is occurring. He just simply finds himself saying, God, I just need you to be with me in this. 
And we see that in Melissa, but also we also see that in all of you here as well, in the friends and the family that have come here to support her, because she drew such courage and strength from you as well. And so this is just a simple request. As we go forward, thank you so much for being here, but life will go on. The days will continue to function. The sun will come up and set. You will have to go to work, but we will have to continue to live without Melissa present as she was. And so it is only this in the fact that you have come here today. Please continue to be present to all of us and each other as we go forward. There will be a continuing ache, a hole in our souls each day. Don't forget that. Speak to each other of the stories that we have heard today. Tell them over and over again. Be present to each other. For in that, we will get through this suffering. There is the loss in the book of Job. There is this cry for your presence in suffering. But then there is this fascinating turn that this book takes. As the book goes along, Job deduces something phenomenal. He says, listen, if God is truly this good, if God is truly this great, if God is truly able to make all of this creation exist, God must also possess the attributes of goodness and love and justice. And if that is true, this life is not enough for those things to occur. There must be another life beyond this. There is not justice on this world if God is truly just, There must be another solution. And he works it out and he says in Job 14 and 14 and 15, if you would set a time to remember me, when all my days of hard service are over, I will wait for my renewal. You will call me from the grave. I will answer you. You will long for the creature you have made. I know that my redeemer lives. It's courageous. It's brilliant. It's not wrong. 2,000 years later, or more, the Christ stood before the grave of his friend Lazarus. And as he stood there, the Pharisees at his side, he knew that if he called to his friend Lazarus to raise from the dead, the Pharisees would do what they were going to do. There is no way they could tolerate somebody raising people from the dead. It would dismantle their religious system. But with courage and compassion, he says, Lazarus, come forward. And the text tells us immediately that the Pharisees decided they would kill him. But the Christ there calls Lazarus forward, as was so beautifully sung, the first fruits comes forward in the form of Lazarus, and then Christ himself risen from the dead to show his power over the grave. And there is a unique promise that comes with that. In Christianity, I think it is particular. See, the Christian promise, because of resurrection, is a heavens and an earth made new. It's not a different place. It's this place. See, the life that you had always wanted, the life that you had deserved, the life that you were meant to have with your mother, with your daughter, with your... That life... Will it be made once again? It's not a different life. It's not a compensation. The very life will be given again on the new heavens and the new earth. For I know that my Redeemer lives. Perhaps we could best sum this up with a quote from Dostoevsky in The Brothers of Karamazov. He writes, I believe like a child that suffering will be healed and made up for that all the humiliating absurdity of human contradictions will vanish like a pitiful mirage. Like the despicable fabrication of the impotent and infinitely small Euclidean mind of man in this world's finale, at the moment of eternal harmony, something so precious will come to pass that it will suffice for all the hearts, for the comforting of all resentments, for the atonement of all crimes, for the blood that has been shed that will make it not only possible to forgive, 
but to justify what has happened. Melissa, we love you. We miss you. We commit you to our memories to lay safe in the arms of Christ until you call once again for all of us to come home. As we are at the conclusion of our program, just a very brief announcement. I will pray and then there will be a postlude. If you would mind giving the family an opportunity to exit the facility first, they will make their way over to the reception. And once they have left, we will follow and greet them there. Let us bow our heads. May the Lord keep us and bless us. 
May the Lord cause his face to shine upon us. May the Lord guide us in all of his ways. Amen.